Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week. And uh, you, we've been uh, airing a series for several weeks prior to some of the live stuff we just shot. But uh, between the time that uh, I want to start another series, I wanted to have my oldest son on the program again with me, Pastor Jeremy Hiles from Word That Frees, Winchester, Virginia. And uh, he's been teaching a lot from the book of Joshua. And so we're going to talk about the book of Joshua here a little bit today. I think it's a powerful story because, you know, much of what I've taught over the last several weeks and that I teach a good bit is how there is an exodus paradigm all through the New Testament. It's about coming out of Egypt, coming out of religion, coming out of bondage, coming out of whatever bondage you're in. Of course, we've always tied that in with how Egypt is a picture of religion because of Revelation chapter 11, where it said, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And so we, we showed how that our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. He was crucified in Jerusalem, the centerpiece of Judaism and Old Covenant, bondage and slavery. Under the Old Covenant, you're a slave. In the New Covenant, you're a son. But the book of Joshua starts out by saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Arise now and get ready to take this promised land. And of course, you know that the name Joshua is the Hebrew name Jesus. And so Moses can bring you out, but only G Joshua or Jesus can bring you in. So there was a transition coming out of Egypt, out of religion, out of the old covenant, out of slavery, and into the freedom of being in Christ. And so it's good to have you on the program with that. That's a pretty good introductory, and just jump in there anywhere you want to. Mm -hmm. So well, It's good to be here again. It's been a little while since we've been able to work this out to do this. Uh, being, uh, um, I'm home a lot with the, my little girls and my littlest one is two. So <laughs> that's the time where they need uh, a, lot of <laughs> a lot of attention. But, <laughs> but it's also a very fun time. We, <laughs> we've been having some pretty fun times, me and her. Yeah. And, and the, also the oldest, the oldest one went back to school this week. And so she's in, she's in the full blown school mode. And so uh, the, the little one, me and her, have just been spending some time together and, and, and connecting and stuff. So it's been some good so time. This but this is kind of your exodus a little bit here. Right? So, but I get a break today. I get a, <laughs> get a little bit of a break. So it's good to be here. Uh, yeah, we were about, we've been teaching for the last couple of weeks from the book of Joshua. Ever since, actually, ever since uh, the quarantine back in 2020, our church had to transition into full-time uh, live streaming. And uh, because our building was also that we were using was a restaurant and we were waiting for that to be able to be open back up. But by that time it happened, that restaurant couldn't open back up. So we kind of lost our building. But So we're in the middle of a transition or uh, with that. But we just uh, I just determined when we went to uh, quarantine and we had to go online to uh, I just determined to do some very uh, uh, strategic and precise teachings. And so we had started out. Uh, in the beginning, talking about the words in red and, and the things that Jesus would say, and that there was, there's, there, you know, you hear people say all the time, like, we got to live by the words in red, but they don't realize sometimes there's context, audience relevance, the things that Jesus was addressing, and those certain things. And so we took the time just to kind of go and explain why Jesus would say certain things the way he said them. Like, you know, sometimes it seems even when you look at the words in red, Jesus can kind of almost contradict himself at mm -hmm. times, but it was depending on who he's addressing. If it was somebody that was under the law, he had to address them from that mindset. But if it was, say, a, a Gentile who had no understanding of the law, Jesus could come to him in a whole nother way and explain to him the kingdom. And so there was, you know, so Jesus was strategic. So we took some strategic time to teach that. Uh, we taught some on the uh, uh, on the book of Romans and and showing that transition of Paul talking about the transition from the time they were living in you know, that, that old covenant system was about to completely come to an end, but what does grace look like? And so Paul spent the first couple of chapters addressing people uh, from a law perspective and almost giving the law, and that. but he ends in chapter 7 and he says, you know, O wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of sins? Seeing that every time I try to do right, evil is always present, I can't seem to get it right and get it together. He was talking about himself under the law, but he starts out, the next thing he says is that, who shall save me from this body of sin? He says, I thank God 
through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And from that moment on, he starts showing what grace and new covenant looks like and life under a new covenant. And so we, we taught that. And like I said, it's just very strategic teachings. And I really felt like the next thing to do was this book of Joshua and even showing some, taking the old, some Old Testament scriptures and showing that this pattern of scriptures goes throughout. And so you had, we had seen in the very last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, God takes Moses up into a mountain shows him the promised land. He says, but you will not enter in because of his disobedience, because he's showing that not even the mediator, and I know you you've probably have taught this and said this on the program many times, but not even the mediator of that law, old covenant system, could make it in by the works of, by his works. Yep. And so God takes him up into a mountain. He shows him the promised land. Some, uh, some scholars and some uh, people believe that the mountain that he took him up into was the very mountain that Christ was crucified in. Mm-hmm. But when God comes back, only one of them comes back. Moses doesn't come back with him. It's God takes him up, says, to me, show you what it looks like. Reminds me of a scene from Men and Mice, where, uh, of Mice and Men, where he's like, just look at the rabbits. Think of the rabbit farm we're going to have. But, but uh, George ain't coming back, you know. And, uh, but it starts out, but, by, but when, when God comes back without Moses, and he buries him, and he says he buries him in a place that no man knows until this day, the next, the next book is the book of Joshua, and it starts out after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. God rose up Joshua, the son of Nun. And so he starts out with a son. Uh, you know, there was a servant in the old covenant, but he's showing a pattern of a new covenant. It starts with a son. That's powerful. And that, you know, we are, you know, we, we talk about like even the prodigal son, when we talk about the prodigal son, since we talked about the words in red even is that this prodigal son goes out, he spends all of his inheritance on riots and slipping, but it says he comes back and he says, I'm going to say to my father, you know, because even his servants had it better than me. And he says, I'm going to come back and I'm just going to be a servant in his house. But when he comes back and tell, tries to tell the father he just wants to be a servant, the father welcomes him back as a son because no matter what, a son can never go back into a servitude. And so we, you know, one of the patterns I'm starting to see even from the book of Joshua is that it is a, what brings us into this promised land is a, I talk a lot about um, mind change or repentance. You know, that word repentance is the Greek word metanoia. It means to change your mind. And I believe one of the biggest things that needs to happen in the church and in Christians today is they need to have a repentance or a mind change. I believe in the repentance where I got down at an altar, I gave my life to the Lord, cried and snotted, and I know the Lord came into my heart and had a real encounter with the Lord. I believe in that repentance, but I believe there is for believers also an ongoing repentance. Absolutely. Where it's not that we keep asking God to forgive us of our sins, but to change our minds into a mind of Christ. He says, uh, don't be don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so I believe as believers, once we've had that encounter at the altar, there is an ongoing repentance or mind change that we are changing our, our minds from a servant mentality, old covenant mindset to one of sonship and of new covenant. How do we live in this new covenant? And one of the things I, I, that really when I started out even in this book of Joshua was in chapter 18, it says that Joshua took them, they're sitting in a place, they're sitting in Shiloh and they set up the, 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 the tabernacle. And Joshua, the Lord speaks to Joshua, he says, how long will they not possess their possessions, seeing that the land is subdued before them? When he says that, he said there was only about, I think there was seven tribes, seven or eight tribes, maybe even nine, that had not yet received their inheritance. Now, if you remember, two and a half of those tribes had received it on the other side of Jordan. So we're talking about only one or two that had actually gotten their inheritance inside this promised land. Yeah. And so Joshua sends out men from there, from these tribes and says, I want you to go out and, and, and map the land. I want you to write down what it looks like, explore it and tell me, and then come back here and we're going to draw lots and, and divide this land up because it's time you inherit your inheritance. I think it's funny is that they had lived in this wilderness for so long, just living in tents, going from one place to another. I always say it like, they, they followed the cloud, They're, and they, they would experience different things and aspects of God by following that crowd. But it all reminds me of the church mindset of always following the next move of God, mm-hmm. but never entering into the fullness of what God wants us to have. Now, if you remember, when they were living in that wilderness, they would spent 40 more years in that wilderness than God had planned for them, and they spent that 40 years because of their unbelief to enter in the first time. Yep. 
And they, but God told them, he says, I'm going to give you a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you houses you did not build, vineyards you did not plant. And he says, I'm going, there are inhabitants in that land that's there only to keep this stuff until you go in and possess it. And then I'm going to drive them out from before you. Well, Moses' day, they sent in 10, or they sent in 12 spies. 10 of them came back with an evil report said, but there's what they said. They came back with the evidence of everything that God told them is true of the land. And they came back with a report and said, everything God said is true. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It, there are, he, there are, there are walled cities. There are giant houses. There are all this stuff, but we won't enter in because there's giants in this land and we're grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we'll be in theirs. Think of that. Yeah. But when Joshua's, Joshua, when he goes to enter into the land in chapter two, he sends two spies in. And they come back, and the report of the people, the inhabitants of the land is, how, long, how come it's taking you guys so long to get here? Our hearts have already melted because of all the things we've heard God did for you in a wilderness. Yeah. We knew that once you got here, our time was over and that God was going to give you this, this land and that this stuff was yours. And we have been waiting for you in fear. So it was the giants and the inhabitants of the lands that were living in fear of a people who did not enter in because of unbelief. And it reminds me so much of Christianity at large. We do not enter in to the promises of that are available to us today. We keep waiting for, you know, someday we're going to get this. Someday it's going to happen. Someday when, you know, I don't know, <laughs> Jesus comes back. or something, Their mindset of something, waiting on something, rather than calling it today, like the book of Hebrews says, is those, blessed is those that call it today. They don't enter in because of unbelief, but yet the inhabitants that we are afraid of, almost, really what we don't realize is their hearts have already melted. They're already defeated. They already know that the houses and the vineyards and the, and, and the possessions already belong to us, and all we have to do is begin to have some faith and enter in to what God said is already true. You know, people keep waiting on heaven to come rather than seeing that heaven is available and we enter into heaven today. Yep. And so the whole book of Joshua is, is taking these people that have been living under an old covenant, almost uh, uh, weak in faith. And he first thing he says to them is he tells, go, he tells his captains, go through the people, tell them to prepare their victuals for in three days we're going over this Jordan. And he gives them no choice. He gives them no even before he, he's going to send two spies in, but he's already told the people, no matter what their report is, we're going in and we're possessing this land. And he's going in in three days. When I see three in Scripture, it oh, yeah. always reminds me of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There's patterns in Scriptures. Yep. And one of the things when you see three yep. in Scripture always speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So they're going in from an understanding of the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection. And so he ta he's going to take them in. And when he sends, again, when in chapter 18, he says, they're, they're living in one spot. They got all these tribes living in one possession. But there's still all this stuff. There's, I mean, it's a vast amount of land that still has not been inhabited. When the, the people that came back to tell uh, Joshua, or yeah, to tell Joshua what it looked like, he says to them, they said, there are walled cities in this land still. There are, uh, he, there, there's this vast amounts of, of space for us to inherit. He says, there's still giants in this land there's the valley of the giants down here and that and he's just they're describing all this still possession when i hear that one of the things i've all that that really spoke to me several years ago when i began to realize that what kept them out of the promised land was giants is that god told them i'm going to give you houses you did not build vineyards you did not plant when they came back from spying out the land the first time it says it took two men to carry one cluster of grape grapes. When I go to the grocery store, I can hold a cluster of grapes in about two fingers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This took two men. So when I began, what I really began to understand is that God was not giving them just enough to get by, that he was telling them, I've got some giant houses for you to inherit. I've got some giant vineyards for you to begin to eat from the fruit of. It's not just a small thing. God's got some abundance for us. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Paul says is his abundance of grace for us, you yeah. know, and that where where sin abounded, grace did so much more abound. And so in this promised land, there are some abundance of grace, but even more than just spiritual things, 
There's also natural things that's available to the people of God. If we just begin to change our minds and begin to have a repentance and begin to follow Joshua into this three days and cross this Jordan. And so the more I begin to, the more I begin to open this book and study, the more I'm realizing just how much is available to us you know, that God was showing them from an Old Testament scripture that really is something that's supposed to be speaking to us in this day about really what is available to us now. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, I believe that there is inheritance for us on the other side of the grave. But I think really what we need to awaken the church to is not what's available to us Absolutely. on the other side of the grave, but really what's available to us today. And that where we look at the, sometimes we Christians have gotten so caught up even in news and social media that we see giants yeah. and we are fearful to even enter in. And we're just going, I hope, I hope somebody comes and fixes this scene. Yeah. Rather than realize that there is something mighty inside of us. This is our, this is our inheritance. This is what yeah. God has given us today. That heaven is available in the earth. He said when he taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And he's, God is wanting us to begin to enter into this earth and bring heaven to earth and see that this land is subdued before us and that there's a mighty voice within the, 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 the church and within Christians to begin to, if there's things in this world or if there's giants in this world, we need to stop being fearful of them and see their hearts have already melted inside of them. And there's some things that they've just been living in just to keep it until we get there mm -hmm. and begin to re, really receive our inheritance in this land right now. Mm -hmm. Well, there was, you know, I, I, while you were saying that, I thought it's a powerful thought because, you, you know, if you have giants, you have to have giant houses. Yeah. They have to have giant food. They have to have giant everything. And so the abundance that was there, that was, they were keeping it for us. But the thought hit me as well that, uh, you know, I thought this powerful thought that, you know, that, that, that they saw the giants, but the giants saw how big their God was. Mm -hmm. They had heard of how God had opened the Red Sea. And I was thinking while you said that, that, you know, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes to the church of Corinthians. He says, don't, don't fall after the same example of unbelief. Mm -hmm. And he says, and he says that they murmured and snakes came among them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think it's easy. And, you know, I have to really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach Sunday at our home church and, I was kind of thinking about, you know, Psalm 77, where, you know, Asaph said, I complained until my spirit was overwhelmed. And I think sometimes we get our focus on, like you said, how big the giants are, how big the problems are, how much. And, you know, I have to tell myself this. I mean, you have to encourage yourself in the Lord mm -hmm. sometimes because, you know, uh, it's like, you know, um, I have a lot of people that follow me on social media and, there's not a moment goes by that we're not managing some kind of a crisis. And after a while, it can get you focused on the crises and think it's really, really bad. And if you sit and listen to the news, I had to literally put myself on a fast mm -hmm. from listening to the news because everybody's got an agenda and it's all fear filled. But when you start to get your focus off of that immediate problem, because if, in, if, if murmuring created an environment for snakes to operate, Praise and worship gives an opportunity for God to worship. And I think that's part of the repentance mm -hmm. is we've got to do is we've got to shift our thinking and even sometimes remind us, even Asaph in Psalm 77 said, uh, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. And he starts even remembering your way is in the sea, O God. So he started to go back and remember some things God's already done before, how He opened the Red Sea, how God brought them through, how He brought divine supply to them throughout, uh, you know, the whole wilderness journey. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes I, we, how quickly we forget what God's already done. And, you know, uh, like you said, the enemy already knows, you know, he's defeated. And, uh, you know, he knows that, you know, it, it's almost as if they were saying, where you guys been? Mm -hmm. You know, that might, you know, I think it's, I, I think, Honestly, I really believe the Lord's saying that to folks listening today is like, where you been? Mm -hmm. You know, you need to show up in this hour to possess some things that right the church needs to lose their losing mentality. Yep. And begin to, you know, lose their grasshopper mentality. And uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I was thinking even of uh, the book of Joel, where Joel said, you know, that. The army that came in that barked the fig tree and brought famine and brought groaning and 
and the, the stall was empty. And I mean, he began, he said that he talks about the locust and the canker worm and the pommel worm is eaten. I'm going to restore. But if you look at that in the Amplified Bible, that's not four different bugs. That's four different stages of the same bug. It starts out crawling locust, then a hopping locust, then a flying locust, then a gnawing locust. And what it is, is like it starts out these, these losing mentalities. I'm a yep. grasshopper. Starts out small. And then when you feed into it, it begins to be hopping. Mm -hmm. First thing you know, it's airborne. And then it's all of a sudden brought you into a place of great, uh, you know, demise and where you, you're discouraged. But when John the Baptist came on the scene, he said, repent, change the way you think. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John was eating locust and wild honey. Mm -hmm. So if you can destroy the grasshopper meant he was a bug eater. The yep. man was a bug eater. He was eating, <laughs> he was eating the locusts. And when he ate the locusts, it released the honey. Yep. And that's the kingdom of God. It's the change. When you change the way you think from the grasshopper mentality to the kingdom mentality, mm -hmm. you start to lose the, uh, you know, the, that whole losing mentality. Yeah. I've, uh, I've said for several years now of how important this repentance has and how much we have taken it and, and really, uh, diminished it yeah. you know I I, I, I I am wholeheartedly uh, love the people's altar encounters yeah. I you know, I love you know yeah. we haven't been able to do youth camp for the last couple of years and stuff but uh, I love those times whenever people are experience God for the first time God's coming to their ha their hearts they're receiving the Holy Ghost I love that stuff I I, yeah. you know, I love to be a part of that I love to see people have those encounters I love to just get around the altar and just cry and weep with them as they're receiving the Lord you know but but I, I really think somewhat we have diminished it just to that and we haven't taught people how to have the ongoing repentance of, of changing our minds, understanding again, like you said, uh, that like John eating the locust, showing us that these things are not as powerful as we made them to be and that they become food for us. I think there's a scripture that these giants have become food for us. And so we are having to change our mindsets about some stuff and realize that we are, you know, we are, again, we look at the world, we even go to church sometimes and hear how great the world is, how powerful the world is, how powerful the devil is. And sometimes we've not been taught just how powerful we are yeah. and how powerful God is. Yeah. And I think if we started changing our minds, start proclaiming just how powerful we are as the sons and daughters of God, start uh, you know, proclaiming how great uh, our God is, how great our Jesus is, how good our Jesus is, I think it would strike some fear in some hearts of some giants and some enemies that we have you know, we have built up in our minds and see they're not as powerful as we thought they were. There's something more powerful. You think about... Uh, even in the early church, 12 men started out hiding in an upper room from, from those they, they thought were going to come and kill them and put them to death. They have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. It changes their mind. All of a sudden, the, the kingdom has come, and they, their minds are changed, and they start realizing just how powerful they are. And They start going out into the streets and proclaiming who Christ was. And those 12 men, begin. it started like wildfire that just began to spread out throughout the whole world until eventually it changed not only uh, the enemies that they thought were going to come and kill them, did it, did it bring their demise to, but it also got into the heart of the Roman Empire that the Roman Empire, who served all these other gods and had, had been uh, just like almost barbaric, got into the hearts of even emperors and, and rulers and changed the whole Roman Empire to, you know, they began to begin to be predominantly even Christian, and, and, and it just began to be this thing that changed the whole world. Now, if that could happen in that day yep. with just 12 men, how much more could it happen in a, in a world full of sons and daughters of Christ? It just needs to have it just needs to have a repentance and awakening to just who they really are and the power of God that's really in them and available to them. That's why I think repentance is so important and so much more than just our altar encounter. It is really reading our getting in here and finding out, dividing the word of truth correctly, learning who we are in Christ, what Christ did to set us free, how, how powerful of the Holy Spirit sent us so that we can be an answer to the world to see the world really impacted and changed and, 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 and experience a life and that more abundantly. The world doesn't need more death. It needs some life and it needs it more abundantly. It needs some people to begin to speak with the tongues of angels and the tongues of sons and daughters of God, really. And, you know, I think while you were talking about, you know, as it coming to, he said to them, arise and go walk through the land mm -hmm. and describe it. And maybe instead of preaching 
what all is wrong and how bad it is, we need to start describing what we have in Christ. Yep. Because in you know, in the New Testament, we know, uh, and may not hurt nothing to mention this, but Hebrews, the fourth chapter, really declares to us that, that, that the promised land is really not a piece of real estate anymore. It's rest in the finished work of yep. Jesus Christ. It's, and rest is really the place of faith. It's where you've come to really trust and believe what God said is true. And so, you know, when I think about the promised land, I think about it not being a piece of real estate, but what we have because we're in Christ. And because we're in Christ, it is a land that flows with milk and honey, and all things that pertain to life and to godliness are ours. And so as we begin to walk through the land and describe it, we begin to, you know, look at what really belongs to me as a believer. What is my inheritance, yep. you know? And an inheritance is not something you earn. It's something you receive as because somebody died and left you something. And when you begin to walk through that land and describe it and what it is and preach what it means to live in Christ, then people's faith begins to rise. It says, that's really mine. Yep. That giant house could be mine. That giant fruit could be mine. That you know, And I think it even works like you said in the natural. Yep is that when you begin to arise and you explore it, you know. And a, a, another thing he said, you know, we're about to run out of time here for a few, in just a few moments, but one of the things he, 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 he says there also is, uh, you know, as you are looking through the land, he said, then you are going to dispossess mm -hmm. all of these giants and these rulers. You're going to dispossess. And I, back several years ago, I preached a message titled, You Need to Dis What's Dissing You. You Need to Dis Disappointment. You need to dis disease because disease is the opposite of ease. You need to dis discouragement because you need courage. In other words, you need to stop claiming ownership of some things yep. that doesn't belong to you. Discouragement, defeat, uh, sickness, disease, poverty, all of those things don't belong to us. And we need to dispossess them and say, that's not, I'm not, I'm not claiming ownership to that. It has no right here. And, you know, even just this season, mom and I literally even went back and anointed our doors with oil and said, listen, none of these diseases will come upon us. That That's the promise of God is that none of these diseases will come upon us. Well, we're about to run out of time, mm -hmm. but we're going to come back and talk about this some more. Uh, if you'd like to sow into this ministry, we do need your help to be able to take this kind of message around the globe. Uh, if you'd like to do that, you can call the number that comes up on the screen or you can go to our website is the easiest way to do it. And there's a place where you can give via credit card or PayPal. You can also send a check or a money order to the address that will come up on the screen. And we appreciate all that you do to help us. And it does take your giving to keep us on the air. God bless you and thank you for joining us. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.